Welcome to our ongoing classes on the seven Noahide commandments. And today's class is a continuation from the previous classes. This is the sixth in this series that the text we're studying right now is from the Encyclopedia Talmudis, the Talmudical Encyclopedia, which is in Hebrew. We are on, in volume three, and the topic, which is in alphabetical order, is Ben Noyach, a Noachide. Um, this encyclopedia was compiled by a group of Torah scholars. The chief editor was Rabbi Zevin of Blessed Memory, and it originally came out, this volume at least came out around 1951, and since has been um, revised and a number of times has been reprinted. As an encyclopedia, it is informative. Uh, there's not really a lot of opinion or um, philosophical speculation, but it's really accurate information which is directly taken and gleaned from the Talmudic sources and what we call the Rishonim, which are the um, sages, the great rabbis, the codifiers, which came after the conclusion of the Talmud, and then the Achroinim, which are the more recent um, rabbis. And in the footnotes, the references, everything is referenced and everything is explained as to where the source for that is. So certain things may seem controversial. They'll bring down the controversy. Um, and if it isn't clear which way the um, Jewish law rules, what the halacha is, so they will say so. They will leave it as such. So it's really very, very accurate. Um, we are currently on page Shin Nun Ches, which would be 358, we're on the right-hand column, towards the bottom. We've gone through all of the seven Noahide commandments, and now we're going through additional things. Uh, for instance, the piece that we just finished, the last class, was about additional prohibitions which are not or don't seem to be directly one of the seven or six, if you're going to count one of them, dinim, as a positive commandment. Um, just before we start the next piece, which begins with betoisefes mitzvah, and that means adding a mitzvah, which I know that at least uh, today, for sure, there are many Noahides that are interested in being able to perform positive acts, whether it's a ritual act or some type of a commandment or some type of an act, a positive act, to be able to come closer and to make that relationship with God. So this is the next piece which is going to discuss that. But before that, I just want to do the previous two lines, which I'm not sure we did in the previous class. Bain shloishim hamitzvois, amongst the 30 commandments, shekibu aleim b'nei noyach, that the B'nai Noyach have accepted upon themselves, Chashvu, it has been incorporated or included, Shemechabdi Mesatera, that they are to honor, to show respect to the Torah. And that's all he's saying, and he gives you a reference to that. Um, otherwise, we've discussed a whole bunch of things that are forbidden, or at least according to some opinions, are forbidden for Bnei Noyach. And not to uh, go over the previous class, but just to mention as a quick reminder, without even translating, Kilayim was one, Hashchosas Zera was another, Kishuf was another. And to understand those, so I refer you back to our previous classes. At any rate, let us continue. And at this point, what we're going to be discussing, as I just mentioned, is additional mitzvahs. What 
additional um, observance may or may not a Ben Noyach take upon himself. And again, just to remind you and to reiterate, being that this is an encyclopedia, it's extremely accurate, and much of it is direct quotes, whether it's from the Talmud or from the Rambam, Maimonides, or other sources. So again, we're on the right-hand column, the last paragraph. Ein manichim l'nochrim l'chadesh das. We, the Jewish people, do not allow non-Jews to innovate religion. Velasois mitzvois and to perform commandments la'atzmam for themselves, midaitam on their own. So we're not supposed to allow non-Jews to perform mitzvahs. Ella Rather, oy yihiyeh ger tzedek v'yekabel alav kol hamitzvois. Either the individual has the op- option and the opportunity; they shall become what's called a ger tzedek, a righteous convert, which means that they accept the Jewish religion upon themselves, and they accept upon themselves to keep all the commandments. That would be all six thirteen, and they become what we would call a full fledged Jew. That is referred to as a ger tzedek, a righteous convert, a total, complete convert, someone who wasn't Jewish, and they became Jewish, they became a member of the Jewish nation. Oi, or alternatively, yamayd b'seira soi, sheva He will stand, he will remain um, devoted and loyal, to his Torah, to the teachings that he's supposed to follow, namely the seven commandments. And he shall not add nor subtract. And the source for this in footnote 3, 451 is the Rambam and the Me'iri. All right, so both the Rambam and the Me'iri, two Rishonim, state so clearly. So again, there's the seven commandments, we mentioned that there's 30, uh, that there are some additional ones, but otherwise, outside of the official seven, which include many, many other details, fine, but otherwise, if an individual who's not Jewish wants to perform a mitzvah or mitzvahs, they have the option of either becoming Jewish or remaining with their seven mitzvahs and everything which is related to those seven, and they may not add nor subtract. Ulafichach and therefore, Ben Noyach, Sha'asak Betera, Chay of Misa, a Noachide that was involved in Teira, that studied Teira in a way of Asak, which means to um, make it his business or to be very much involved, is liable to the death penalty. It is a capital offense. Shenemar, as the verse states, Teira Tziva Lanu Moishe, Moi Rasha. In the book of Devarim, it states that Teira was commanded to us, the Jewish people, by Moishe, Moses, Moi Rasha. The simple translation of the word is that it is an inheritance. It's an inheritance for the Jewish people. And the way we're explaining this, the way the Talmud emphasizes this in Sanhedrin, is that it's for us, the Jewish people, an inheritance, and not for them. It's for no one else in the world other than a member of the Jewish faith. And he, the Ben Noyach, should not be involved, Ella, rather, Sheva Mitzvah Shalahem Bilvad, in their seven commandments alone. That's all. They have to stay focused and have to stay loyal to the study of their seven mitzvahs. Now, obviously, they're not only permitted, 
but they're encouraged to study Torah which relates to the seven mitzvahs for a very simple logical reason. If they're expected to keep these seven properly, well then, how are they supposed to know what to do if they don't study them? So there's absolutely nothing wrong with a Ben Noyach being oisek, being very much involved in the study of the seven mitzvahs B'nai Noyach, but only in the seven. Shafilu nachri shoisek batera. Because, so to say, the flip side of it, we just got through making a very extreme statement, a very strong statement. And if you never heard this before, it could be a kind of shocking that a Ben Noyach is forbidden to be oisek in Torah, and if he is, chayv misa, put to death, liable to be put to death. But now the flip side, when we're saying that he's permitted or encouraged to study Torah, which is the seven mitzvahs, so we say as follows, shafilu nachri, shoisek batera, that a non-Jew that is involved in Torah study, Basheva mitzvah shalem, that is in their seven mitzvahs that we just said, which is for them to study. Hu kechayhen gadol. He becomes like the high priest. That's a tremendous, tremendous level. So a non Jew has the opportunity, has the ability, certainly has the right to do something which makes him, in a certain sense, reach the sanctity or the status, something, of the high priest. That's the holiest Jew. Shenemar, and as the verse states, this is the proof text, this is a, a verse in Vayikra, Leviticus, Asher yase oisam ha'adam v'chai bohem, that the man, the Adam ha'adam, will do them and will live by them. And our Chachamim, our sages in Sanhedrin and in other places, explain this verse as follows. Koyhanim, the priests amongst the Jews, Leviim, the Levites, the Yisraelim, and the regular Israelites, the three types of Jews that there are. Loinamar is not stated in this verse. It doesn't say that if the Koyhanim or the Leviim or the Israelim keep these precepts or study these things and live by them. Ella rather, Ha'adam, it says the man. And we know that the term Ha'adam as a rule refers to all of mankind. Whenever a verse says Ha'adam, that is referring to any human being. So for a non Jew, to study Torah, there's two sides to the coin. On the one hand, forbidden. On the other hand, it's the greatest thing and he becomes like the high priest, which is a very positive thing. We're saying it only in a positive light. And again, it depends on what, what aspect, what area, what subject in Torah he is studying. Third line on the left-hand column. Loi noisaf isur zeh Al Sheva Hamitzvois. So this prohibition for a non Jew to study Torah, which is the inheritance solely for the Jewish people, and the non Jew has no right to it, is not added, does not apply to the seven mitzvahs, to the Torah of the seven mitzvahs. Lefi, because Sharez Bichal Gezel. Now a non-Jew is not allowed to study Torah if it's not seven mitzvahs. So why is that prohibition not one of the seven? We keep asking the same question. Whenever we bring up any prohibition for the non-Jew, and it's not one of the seven, so each time the obvious question is, so why isn't it one of the seven? And generally speaking, as we covered in the previous classes, generally the answer is, that somehow it does fall under the category of one of the, of one of the seven. And sometimes there's different opinions which one of the seven he's transgressing. In this case, a non-Jew that is oisek, that studies Torah, 
What is he transgressing that we said Chayav Misa? Hareza Bichlal Gezel. This is included in thievery, robbery. He's stealing. Mekeivan Shatera Yerushalanu Veloilahem. Because the Torah is an inheritance for us, the Jewish people, and not for them. So you took something which is mine. You have no rights to it. That is a form of gezel, stealing. Oi, alternatively, shubichlal arayos, that it's actually included in the prohibition of adultery. How is that? So this is a little bit homiletic. Lemisha Deiresh, according to the one that derives and interprets the word in this verse of Torah, Tziva, Lanu Moshe, that the Torah was commanded to us, the Jewish people, by Moshe, Moirasha. So again, the simple translation of that word means an inheritance. However, so to say, a play on the word is Moirasha, Milashain Meirasa. It can come from the term Meirasa, which means throat. Married. We, the Jewish people, are, so to say, married to the Torah. That the Torah is betrothed to the Jewish people alone. A woman may not have more than one husband at a time. That is a serious prohibition. If she is married to one person and she is with anyone else, that is adulterous. So since we learn out of this word in the verse that the Torah is mi'oyrasa, married to the Jewish people, so if anyone else tries to be oisek, to study Torah, they are taking, so to say, the wife of the Jewish people. So we have two alternatives as to which of the seven is the prohibition of a non-Jew studying Torah, either stealing or adultery. The Yesha Kosfu, and then there are those that wrote, She'ein Elu Elo Asmachtois Be'alma, that both of these opinions, which both actually derive it from the same verse, from the same word in the same verse of Moirasha, they don't mean to take it as the actual proof text for the prohibition. But rather it's what's called in the Talmudic language asmachta. Asmachta basically means that there's a certain law, a certain rule, and we don't necessarily have a verse which serves as a proof text to that. It's the oral law, so there's so many rules regulations, laws that are not written explicitly in the written law. And for some of those, we have a verse which can hint to that concept. But it doesn't mean that that's really the source. It's something that we can rely upon and it's something which, in a way of a hint, is pointing to that idea. So some say that's the case here. That it isn't really under the category of gazel of stealing, or really under the category of arayas, of adultery. But it's just an asmachta. And therefore, a non-Jew that is involved in Torah study, when it's not the seven mitzvahs, doesn't get put to death by any court system. And when it says chayev misa, it means by the heavenly court. It's between this individual, Ben Noyach, and God. He's committing a transgression which is very severe, which is considered the death penalty. But it's not that the Jewish court, or for that matter, the secular uh, the court that is established by the Ben Noyach to uphold their laws, they would put someone to death for transgressing any of the six. But for this, they would not. And therefore, 
So that would be the reasoning as to why it's not included in the seven. Because even though it's forbidden, and we're using a very harsh language by saying Chai of Misa, that it is actually an offense which deserves the death penalty, but it's not a death penalty that man will give. Therefore, it's not one of the seven. Because for all the seven, it is uh, punishable by the court. The Yesh Mehari and then there are from the early um, codifiers, the early commentaries, Shekosav that wrote, Bitam Isur, what's the reason for the prohibition? Why indeed may a non-Jew not study Torah? Shenire, for it appears, Kemishu Mibnei as if he is a member of our nation. If he is Isaac in Torah, it will appear as if he's a Jew. Because people will see that he has Torah knowledge. He knows Torah. Well, that looks like a Jew. And the problem with that is that people will come to be able to make a mistake and follow him inappropriately. So it's really as a border, as um, a safeguard, that people should not think that this person is a Jew and therefore I may follow him in all sorts of terror ways. Um, not exactly the same, but there is a related um, issue and that is that one should not sell a talis, the prayer shawl, to a non-Jew if you know that his intention is to wear it. And part of the discussion there is that he may seem Jewish and then someone may go along with him. But in that case, it's a bit different because it could be that that person is not a proper a law-abiding Ben Noyach, but that person might actually be one who's going to kill someone. So it might simply endanger the very life of the Jew. And this guy looks Jewish because he's wearing the talus. So on a similar vein, we're saying over here that a Ben Noyach should not be studying Torah because if he knows Torah, other than the seven mitzvahs related, so then perhaps people might mistakenly follow him when they're not supposed to. Jews, that is. The Chosvu Rishonim. Now, there are other Rishonim that wrote, Shemutar lelameid ha-mitzvahis l'noitzrim u'lemashcham el dasenu. That it is permitted to teach the commandments to the Christians and to draw them to our religion, namely Judaism. For they believe in the text of the Bible that it hasn't changed. They don't change one iota of what they call the Old Testament. What they do merely is that they are inappropriately misinterpreting within a corrupt way. They're giving wrong explanations and interpretations to the text. And they explain the Tanakh, the Bible, again, what they call the Old Testament, those 24 books, they explain them with their well-known interpretations and explanations which are wrong and are corrupt. Now if, however, they will be placed, they will be shown and they will be corrected and they will be put into the right explanation, show them what the true explanation is, it is possible that they will return to go in the proper way. 
Therefore, some say that it's permissible to teach mitzvahs, even not seven Noahide mitzvahs, to teach Torah, to teach mitzvahs to the Christians, because it's very possible that they will then <clears throat> accept the correct, proper Jewish tradition that we have as a Maseiris, going all the way back to what's God given from Sinai. And even if they do not return to the right path, even if they do not accept the true interpretation of the Torah, we the Jews will not get any type of a stumbling block from this. No negative results will come from this. And they won't find in their writings anything different than our writings. So there's only to gain and nothing to lose. Aval, however, Asur Lilamed Laishma'ilim. It is forbidden to teach to the Muslims. Kihaim, for they, Ma'aminim, believe, Shatayraseinu Eina Mishamayim, that our Torah is not divine, it's not God given from heaven. And if we, the Jews, teach the Islams something which opposes their belief of their book, this will be a stumbling, this will be something which will cause problems for the Jewish people. So according to this opinion, there's a clear distinction between who we're teaching, which of course then opens up a whole discussion which we're going to hold off, at least at this point. And that whole discussion would be, how about an individual who wants to accept God and the given laws that God gave to the world through Moses at Har Sinai, Mount Sinai. He doesn't want any other religion. He denounces categorically any other religion. He's not Christian. He's not a Muslim. He believes in nothing other than God giving the Torah to the Jews and through Moses commanding all of mankind to keep these seven. What about such a person? So, presumably, there should be, I don't know if no, but not much of restrictions to teaching him Torah, according to this opinion at least, that says that you're allowed to teach the Christians because they believe in the basic text. They just have warped and corrupt and misinformation and wrong interpretations. So if you could teach it to such a person with the hope that they're going to accept the correct interpretation, and if they don't, so you didn't lose anything, us Jews lost nothing, because they're just as bad as they were beforehand, but we didn't lose anything, whereas the case of Yishma'ilim, of the Islam, is different. Well, then if a person is even better than a Christian, and he says, I don't believe in any of that. I just read the Bible. I read the text. So can you give me the true interpretation? According to this opinion, seemingly, there wouldn't be a problem. That would be fine. But let's leave that discussion for another time. <clears throat> Continuing, we are on Shin Nun Ches on the left-hand column. V'chein and likewise. Nachri Sheshovas Chayav Misa. A non-Jew that for lack of a better word, rested. But let me um, deviate for a moment or so at this point. And we have discussed this in the past in other classes. Um, with regards to Shabbos, in the Torah, there is uh, a mitzvah, which is considered 
takes a major, major part. It's a very, very major mitzvah. And that is called the mitzvah of Shabbos. Shin Beis Saf. It's a difficult word to properly translate into English. What's forbidden for a Jew to do on Shabbos is called melacha. And it's commonly translated as work or labor. I don't think that that's accurate. I don't have a better word. It needs to be defined and explained. Um, because when you say you can't work on Shabbos, what does work mean? It could be a relative term. So really, there's a whole set of forbidden activities on Shabbos. And in general, there's 39 of them, biblically speaking, and each one of them has many. According to some, each one of those 39 actually has 39 subdivisions, and they're all biblically forbidden. And those are called melacha. Um, just to give you an idea. I know we're sidetracking, but I think it's important. Um, in today's modern world, with all the technology that we have. The use of much of the technology is forbidden on Shabbos for a Jew. Much of it is biblically forbidden. I'm not talking about that throughout the generations the rabbis added things as safeguards and how they apply, but let's just, for the moment, Everyone agrees, all rabbinic authorities of the modern day of the past hundred years or so, agrees that the use of electricity, uh, I shouldn't say the use, that the tampering with electricity on Shabbos is forbidden. But that's a whole discussion for itself, and there are literally not only essays, but books, volumes written about that topic. Because what is electricity? We have to first define what is it. Is it fire or isn't it? Once we define it, then we know how to deal with it. But at the moment, just take my word for it that it is forbidden for a Jew on Shabbos to deal with or to tamper with electricity. Cannot press a button that's going to cause a spark, an electric current, and therefore something's going to happen. So, basically, give you one example. I can give you many, many examples. Just one example. It may not be the best, but it's an example. So, just take it for what it is. For a Jew, on Shabbos, to go into an elevator and to press the button. The guy wants to go up to the 28th floor in this building. He walks in on the ground floor in the lobby. Door opens, he walks in, he presses the 28, that button. Light goes on, and the elevator lifts up. Or as they call it in England, the lift elevates. And it goes past all these floors, depending on the elevator, the lights do go on, they don't go on, the bell rings, doesn't ring, whatever. He gets to floor 28, the door opens, he walks out. That was pretty much effortless. That is a desecration of Shabbos. For a Jew to do that on Shabbos is absolutely forbidden by Jewish law. Can he walk up 28 flights of stairs? Yes, he can. He lives on the 28th floor, or for whatever reason he needs to get up to the 28th floor. The Jew on Shabbos is allowed to walk up 28 flights of stairs. Now, for most people, that's pretty rigorous. And unless you're really in, in shape, you're going to be huffing and puffing and you're going to be out of breath when you get up there. That's permissible. That's not work. That's resting on Shabbos. Whereas to walk into the elevator, press the button, go up in a matter of seconds, that's called work. Therefore, um, I don't want to use the word work nor the word rest. 
The word is Shavisa, Shabbos. And that's what a Jew needs to do on that day. And the word is Milacha, which is the type of activity which is forbidden for a Jew to do. So now, after having said that, again, we're on Shin Nun Ches, left-hand column, the second-to-last paragraph. I'm sorry, uh, third-to-last, V'chein. V'chein nachri sheshovas chayv misa. So likewise, a non-Jew that, and again, I don't want to say rested, that was shoyves on Shabbos is liable to the death penalty. And of course, the, the condition is, if he is in fact refraining from doing melacha, that's what shoyves means, if he is being shoyves, as a religious activity or as a commandment from God, then it's Chayv Misa. Um, in footnote 362, so they bring down that a uh, different opinion to what, he, what it just said here we said that it's conditional. The only time that it's forbidden or that it's a capital offense is if he's doing it as a religious practice. And they say that, that the source that would be the Rambam, Maimonides. But then they add, there are those that disagree and hold that this is not in the category of innovating new religious observance or taking upon themselves religion which is not theirs. Rather, there is actually a mitzvah for people that are not Jewish to do melacha every day. So according to that opinion, if a person simply is relaxing and is not doing any melacha on any given day, he would be transgressing. But that's in the footnote, and that's the other opinion, but otherwise what they said in the text itself is the more commonly accepted opinion, and that is that it's only if the person is doing it for a religious purpose, which practically speaking would be a, you know, make a really big difference. Um, if a person, can he take a day off? Can he have a vacation? Can a person just relax one day and just you know, spend a day in relaxation doing nothing? You know, If the person didn't turn on and off any lights, all the person is doing is just taking a suntan, well, maybe that's a problem. But whatever, the person is just relaxing in his own home and just reading a book. So if he's not doing it for religious purpose, according to what we said here, there's no problem and that's not called Shabbos. Um, but according to the other opinion, that would be forbidden. The Afkan, back to the text itself. And here too, Yesh Me'arishoyinim Shekosav, there is, from the Rishonim, someone who wrote, Hatam, what is the reason why in fact a non-Jew can't make a Shabbos for himself? So it should not appear as if he is a Jew, a member of Yisrael. And others may come to learn from him. And since he's not Jewish, so Jews may learn from him things which they're not supposed to do. So again, that would be the same opinion that stated previously uh, why is a non-Jew not to study Torah other than the seven mitzvahs? So we said the reason was that Jews should not uh, be misguided by following him because he seems Jewish, because he has some, such Torah knowledge. So to over here, if you see an individual who's keeping Shabbos, so some make the argument that the reason why it's forbidden to keep Shabbos for a non-Jew is because it looks too Jewish and people, Jews, may um, be misguided by following him. Now what do you do in a case where an non-Jew was oisek in Torah, which we said is forbidden. Chayv Misa. He's not allowed to be involved, to be oisek in Torah study, if it's not the seven mitzvahs. Oishovas. 
or he kept Shabbos in this um, forbidden manner that we just discussed. Oi, chidesh davar betoiras das umitzvah. Or he innovated something, he brought up a new thing in the sense of religion and commandment. He came up with another mitzvah, or he is choosing to perform a mitzvah as a religious act. So what do we do? So previously we said that even though it says Chayv Misa, according to many, he's not actually put to death by the court as he would be for transgressing any of the seven. It means that it's Misa Bidei Shamayim, that the heavenly court would put him to death. So what do we do? Makim Oisoy. We whip him. We give him lashes. The Oinshim Oisoy. And we punish him. Umoidim Oisoy. And we inform him. Shuchayev Misa Bidei Shamayim Alzeh. That he is in fact liable to the death penalty by the heavenly court for this act. We're not killing you. We're just punishing you. We're just whipping you, giving you the lashes. But you should know that this that you did is a capital offense. But he is not put to death for doing that. Um, and again, in footnote 364, this is the Rambam. However, the Ran, which is another Rishon, the Ran disagrees and actually holds that they are killed by the Jewish court for being Oisek in Teira, or keeping Shabbos, or being Mechadesh, um, a type of a religious act. According to the Ran, the court would put the person to death. But again, the more accepted opinion is um, the Rambam, that it's Chayv Misa Bidei Shamayim, that it's a heavenly court type of a death penalty, and the court here would only punish the person and inform him of the severity of what he did. All right. Now, let's see, as we mentioned at the beginning, practically speaking, hopefully we'll be able to glean something on a practical level from what we're about to learn now, about an Anjou who wants to do a mitzvah. He wants to come closer to God. He wants to do something instead of just not transgressing any of the seven. Besides not killing, not stealing, not committing adultery, not committing idolatry, etc. He wants to do something positive. Ben Noyach. The last three lines on Shinun Ben Noyach. I know a chayd. Sherotza lasseis mitzvah. Mishar Mitzvah Satayra, who wanted, who wishes, to do a mitzvah, a commandment, from any of the other mitzvahs of the Torah. <clears throat> and this is a quote, as we're going to see from the Rambam. Um, the question at this point is, what does it mean from the rest of the mitzvahs of the Torah? So in 365, one suggested interpretation of these words means except for the seven. So in a, except for keeping the seven, how about if a Ben Noyach wants to keep another mitzvah of the rest of the mitzvahs of the Torah? So let's go with that explanation at least for now. Why does he want to do a mitzvah? Because he would like to receive reward. He wants to receive reward for doing a mitzvah. Ein moinim oisoi. He is not to be prevented from doing that. La soisa kihil chasa. From doing it properly. Those are the words, and I'm trying to accurately translate them. So again, a ben noyach who wants to do a mitzvah from the rest of the mitzvahs, in order to receive reward, is not withheld from doing that mitzvah or those mitzvahs, kihil chasa, properly, according to the law. And on that note, vim hevi karban oila, and if he brought a burnt offering as a sacrifice, mekabulim mimenu, we accept it from him. Talking about the Jewish uh, court, the Sanhedrin. And 
to keep it simple, let's just say that it's in times that we have a temple. So then, you know, pretty simple. There's nothing, you know, no difficulty. And he's bringing a carbon oil, which is the carbon, the sacrifice that he's allowed to bring. He's not bringing some other offering where we're not allowed to accept it. So he wants to come close to God. He wants to get reward. He has this animal of his. It's a kosher animal. It's unblemished. And he brings it to the holy temple, the Beis Mikdash, And he says, I'd like to offer this sacrifice on my behalf as a carbon oil. We accept it. Nosan Tzedakah. We are now on the top of the next page. Shin Nun Tes. 3.59. He gave charity. Mikablim Mimenu. We accept it from him as well. Even though Tzedakah doesn't seem to be one of the seven, yet he wants to do that mitzvah, that commandment. We accept it. Nechleku Amayroyim. There's actually a dispute in the Talmud between Amayroyim. Amayroyim are the Talmudic sages. So there's actually a dispute. What's the argument? Yeshoimrim. Some say, Shebnei Noyach Makrivim Oilois Veloish Lamim. That Bnei Noyach can offer burnt offerings known as Oilois and not Shlamim. Not I think they're called in English peace offerings, right. Um, a burnt offering is that the animal is entirely offered on the altar and no one eats any of it. It all goes, so to say, um, to God to eat. A shlomim, a peace offering, the part of it goes onto the altar and is burnt. Part of it is eaten by the koyhein, the priest that's offering it, and part of it is actually eaten by the person who brought it. Now, why is it, and how do we know that a Ben Noyach can only bring an oil and not a shlomim? Shene'emar, for there's a verse that states, and this is written in Shir Hashirim, in the Song of Songs by King Solomon. It says, Uri Tzafoin Uvoi Teimon. And let's take a look at that verse inside. Yes, thank you. You might need the other one, though. Get the other one ready. Shira Shirim 416. Thank you. And wouldn't you know it? Basically opened up right to it. Mm. Okay. Shira Shirim 416. And everybody knows about the book of Song of Songs. It's basically um, the love affair between God and the Jewish people. <clears throat> the verse states as follows. Uri Tzafay Nuvoi Seimon. Awake from the north and come from the south. And the verse continues. I'm reading it in, inside the uh, Tanakh. Hafichi gani yizlu v'samav. Like the winds, let my exiles return to my garden. Yavoy doidi leganoi v'yoichal pri megadov. Let but my beloved come to his garden and enjoy his precious people. Now, um, it says as follows. I'm reading from the uh, commentary. Uri tzafin avoy seiman, awake from the north and come from the south, etc. Literally, awake, O north wind, and come, O south. Having found delight in you, command the winds to waft your fragrance afar. Allegorically, Israel's host nations will be so overwhelmed by the miracles preceding the redemption that they will bring the Jews to Eretz Yisrael. As it says in the last chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah 66, verse 20, that the Jews will be brought like in vessels by the nations of the world to Eretz Yisrael, to the Holy Land. So that's what this verse is saying. Uri tzafoin uvoi seimon. Awake north and come from the south. All right? How does that verse teach us about Oila and Achlamim? Vidarshu. And they um, derived, they learned based on this Pasuk in the Talmud, this one opinion. Tisair Uma Shemaseh Batsafain should awaken 
the nation that its deeds are in the north. This refers to the nations of the world that can only bring um, burnt offerings. Because we have a rule. See, when it comes to various different sacrifices, they can't all necessarily be, sac- be slaughtered in the same place in the Holy Temple. Some of them have to be done in the north, as the verse states. And this is in Mishnah, and then the Rambam tells us this as far as Jewish law is concerned. Others can be slaughtered anywhere in the temple. So the carbon oil, the burnt offering, can only be slaughtered in the north. And it shall bring to the king Messiah the nation which its deeds are in the north and the south. Hainu Yisrael, that refers to the Jewish people, Shema Krivim Oilois Ushlamim, that they bring burnt offerings as well as peace offerings, which are brought not only in the north, but can also be brought in the other areas, such as the south. And that which it states, Vayikach Yisrael Chaisein Moshe Oila Uzvachim. One can ask, wait a second. Yisrael, Jethro, the father in law of Moses. He was a Benoyach. He wasn't Jewish. And what does the verse describe? That he took oila, a burnt offering, uzvachim, and peace offering. How's that? So they say, This happened after the giving of the Torah. And therefore, that's a different story altogether. Different, different altogether. But otherwise, a Benoyach can only bring an oil. So that's one opinion. Well, it was pre... Huh? It was before. Yeah, it was before. Ve'ikach Yisraelo Yisvachim, that was after, wasn't it? Oh, I, I thought you were giving... There's an explanation that one... One says it's after, where he converted, and another says it's pre Torah. Well, if he converted, then there's no problem, because he's Jewish. Yeah, right. That's that, No, but that's what I'm saying. There, there's an opinion. I, I thought that's maybe what you were referencing. Yeah, no, this all seems to be... Um, There's an Ari's all uh, interpretation and like a Rashi interpretation. They both like disagree or something like that. I thought I was trying to help you out. <laughs> no, sorry. Okay. That's one opinion, though. The Yeshayim Rim, and then there are those that say in the Talmud, Shemakriv Maf Shlomim, the Pnei Noach are permitted to bring a Shlomim, a burnt, a, a, a peace offering as well. Shenemar, and what's the verse that is their source. For it says all the way in Breshis, the Hevel Hevi Gamu Mi Bechoyreis Tsoinoi U Mechel Vehen. And Hevel, Abel, he too brought from the firstborn of his sheep U Mechel Vehen, and from their fats. Ezeu Dover. What is that that the fats are offered on the altar as a sacrifice, but not its entirety? It says he brought from the fats, which seems to be exclusive. What animal or what type of a sacrifice do you bring the fats, but not the entire animal? Well, that's a burnt. That, that's a peace, peace offering. offering. In a burnt offering, you, there's an lamp or uh, whatever he used, right? The burnt offering, you bring everything. I know, but I thought it was a certain certain type of animal. But Abel wouldn't have been eating the. Uh, Portions of the offering. Well, why not? That's before Noah. So? We know that Adam actually brought a sacrifice. Right. But this, this is written clearly in, in, in the text, in the written Torah, have brought offerings, right? Oh, you're saying because it's an animal and he couldn't eat from yeah. it. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Okay. Or did we say that it's... No, no, he didn't eat, so he didn't eat from it. But the fact that he's not offering all of it on the altar, you're right, you have a point, no one's eating it. Mm-hmm. So, but the fact that he's not offering all of it onto the altar means that it's a peace offering as opposed to a burnt offering. If not, it wouldn't be kosher or something like that? Something wouldn't be kosher about it, maybe. Why is that? Because a burnt offering then, it couldn't be a burnt offering because then it wouldn't be a kosher burnt offering, or no. 
Well, he if can't, he's he can't offering like put some of it there, right, right, that's correct, that's correct. If it's if it's if he's not burning the whole thing, then it's not a proper burnt offering, right? So the fact that he's only bringing the half, the fats that means that it's a different category, it's a different sacrifice. It's not a burnt offering; it's a peace offering. But he's got a good point. He can't be eating it for technical reason because it's an animal, right? What is it that its fats are? Sacrificed on the altar and it's not in its entirety. So you can you, you will conclude and say that it is the peace offering. The oid and furthermore, according to their opinion, this incident that we just quoted with Yisroi bringing the oila uzvachim, he's bringing a burnt offering as well as a peace offering, was prior to the giving of the Torah. There you have it. Yisroi was not Jewish. Torah wasn't yet given, according to one opinion. And he brought a burnt offering and a peace offering. Hmm. All right, so we clearly have a dispute in the Talmud. This is from Zvachim 116a. And in this case, we do have a clear ruling, a halacha. Halacha shemakrivim oides lavad. The halacha is, and that's the Rambam, he's the one who speaks in halacha about karbonus as well, because the code of Jewish law, Shulchan Aruch, does not speak about any of these mm-hmm. laws of sacrifices. So the Rambam, which is what we follow, rules that they can only bring a carbon oila, the burnt offering. So even though there's an opinion that says that a ben noyach is permissible to bring a shlamim, a peace offering, the halacha is only an oila, a burnt offering. What's current? I was going to say there's also an issue. This is bringing it to the temple. Oh, so that's what I said in the beginning. Oh. Let's, to keep it simple, mm. in the meantime, let's say that it's to the temple. Oh, okay. Sorry. Right. Let's not discuss a Ben Noyach who wants to, to make, make his, his own, own altar yeah. and bring his own okay. sacrifice. Sorry. But, it, but we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. have to get to that. That's okay. We, well, but the fact that Rambam has a strange thing, says that if, if he brings a peace offering, it's to be totally burnt. No, did he say that? It, the Rambam says that. There's, there's somewhere where, where it says that if, if he brings a, he's only to bring a burnt offering, and if he brings a peace offering, it is oh. to be totally burnt. So uh, in other words, we accept it, but we correct it. Yeah, yeah. I so think that we about that, that, that might before. be alluding to a previous allowance for a for a ben noach to give a peace offering before before Torah. Yeah, we talked about that like a year or two ago. For ben noach. <laughs> Well, I forget where he got if it if Yithro and if um, Abel Hevel, yeah. Hevel were, were allowed to give peace offerings, that's before Torah, and so the Rambam is uh, is referring back to if, if why somebody can't does, you just say that the Rambam is following the other opinion? Hmm? There's a dispute in the Talmud. There's yeah. two opinions. He's following the opinion that says that it can only bring a, a burnt offering. Yeah, but then if he brings a peace offering, he, Rambam doesn't say if he brings a sin offering, then we do it totally burnt. Okay, let, let me he's, take a He's look. talking about the peace offering. Um, Rambam. Carbonis. Can you find that? <laughs> right there. The book of Carbonis. James might be able to make sense of it. Avoida and Carbonus. I thought it was in the in the Laws of Kings. Oh, maybe I'm maybe I'm thinking of something. No, no, totally no. You, you might you might be onto something. Be, yeah. mm. Oh my goodness! I'm so sorry. Hmm? Okay. No, everything's fine. Yeah. I'm not sure this is the. Want to bring me the one for Avoida? Yes, sorry, Avoida. Mm. Thank you.
This is actually the very last halacha in the laws of sacrifices, of my sacrobonus. Chapter 19, the last halacha says as follows. If someone, referring to a Jew, slaughters a sacrifice of a goy, of an Anjou, outside the base of Mikdash. Now you understand, a Jew is not allowed to bring a sacrifice anywhere outside of the base of Mikdash. Ever since we have the base of Mikdash in Jerusalem, before then it was a different story. But from the time that King Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem, on the Temple Mount, a Jew is forbidden to offer a sacrifice anywhere else. So well, what about a Jew slaughtering it for a non-Jew? It's the non-Jew sacrifice, but he wants the Jew to be the sheikh to slaughter it. Mm. Chayev, that Jew, is liable for doing that. And likewise, mm. if the Jew offers it outside of the Beis HaMikdash, mm. the Jew cannot take that animal mm-hmm. and put it onto the altar. The Hagoyim and the non-Jews, mutarin, are permitted, v'hakriv oilois l'ashem, to offer burnt offerings to God, the Cholmokim, anywhere and everywhere. Mm-hmm. They don't have to do it in the temple. Vihu, and the condition is, she'akrivu ba'boma she'ivnu, that they will do it on the altar that they will build. V'osr l'sayon v'lasis shlichuson, and for a Jew, it is forbidden to assist them or to be their messenger to do anything of any of it for them. Can't slaughter it, can't catch the blood, can't do any of it. For it is forbidden on us to offer anything outside the base of Mikdash, even if it is a non-Jew's carbon. He's allowed to, but I, as a Jew, can't participate. It is mm. permissible for the Jew to instruct mm. them, teach them. Mm-hmm. You can teach them how to sacrifice. For the sake of God, blessed be He. Mm. So they can't physically assist them in any way. But as far as being instructive, absolutely can give classes and teach them exactly how to do it, but the Jew can't actively participate in mm-hmm. any way other than instructing them. So now but you're I talking was, about laws of kings, I was, right? No, I, I found it in the, it's the laws of sacrificial procedures 3.3. 3.3. Three. Three, three. Yeah. So that was in Avodah, not in Carbonus. It's in Maisa Carbonus, which is in the book of Avodah. Interesting. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, three three. Maisa mm-hmm. Carbonus Gimel Gimel. Let's see what it says. What's it called in English? Uh, laws of sacrificial procedures. Sounds like it's Maisa Carbonus. Yep. Hmm. Goy Shehevi Shlamim. A non-Jew that brought a peace offering. Makrivin oisan oilois. So we bring it as a burnt offering. Shagoy libay lashamayim. Because the goy's heart, his intention is for God. So just because he intended the wrong type of carbon that he can't bring, that does not disqualify it. Mm-hmm. We have to do it right. If his intention was for some... You know, uh, idolatrous thing, okay, that's something else. Mm-hmm. But we say, no, no, he meant to bring an animal as a sacrifice to Hashem. Mm-hmm. He just, for whatever reason, is trying to bring a sacrifice that he can't bring. It probably wouldn't have been allowed in Israel to begin with. Wouldn't have been allowed what? Probably wouldn't have been allowed within Israel to begin with without being a... A Gertosha? Yeah, unless it was somehow... Like How about if he's visiting? Or something. No, he's he can't visiting. visit. Can't he, visit. No. He's, bringing a, uh, he's bringing a sacrifice to the temple. Yeah. But he can't. He He's saying he technically can't cross the even border. A visitor. Yeah, he can't. Well, he has to. We've been this before. He has to. He has to behave before. himself when he when, when yeah. he's in Israel. He, he's got. He promises he's go to be. A, a, he promises to be a good. A good he d- does. Does he have to make that promise? He can't just say, mm-hmm. "Look, I live in Africa, and I want to bring an offering to Hashem in the temple." And do we have to interrogate him and ask him to keep the seven? And do you accept? I would think so. Yeah, I thought that's what. That's the whole Gertosha thing. I'm saying maybe he's not a Gertoshev. Then he wouldn't be allowed. But, uh, but according to this, he is. Mm, unless you want to say that he sent it with someone else. Yeah, maybe. That's a good possibility. Well, he has to hand it off to the to Levite at some point. Well, you can make a messenger. Hey, you yeah. going to Israel? Okay. <laughs> Are you like, making it Israel? Like, like for coffee. <laughs> uh, yeah. I got something to send with you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> might be hard to get fast customs, but... (laughs) 
the reason the reason I wonder about this is that it talks about the peace offering. The peace off you know, the animal is accepted and it's used as a burnt offering. So it's almost like it's not considered outlandish that he would think it's okay to bring a peace offering. Right. Whereas it doesn't talk about a sin offering or any other kind of offering. It only it speaks of a peace offering. So I'm thinking that if once upon a time prior prior to the giving of Torah, non Jews could give peace offerings, then today we would say Okay, we're we're going to accept this, but we have to burn it totally. In other words, we're changing its status. It's no longer a peace offering; it's a burnt offering. It's a burnt offering. Yeah, it, it's being done as a burnt offering, but it's not. It's 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 understandable that the person is bringing it as a peace offering because apparently, once upon a time, peace offering was acceptable. See, they bring down over here like this: that in the Talmud. One of the Amiraim, Amar Rav Huna, that Shalme Ho'akum, that the peace offering of the non Jew, Oilois, are really burnt offerings. Why? So he says, alternatively, either it's a verse or it's logic. If you want, I'll tell you the logic. That a non Jew, his heart is for heaven. And Rashi explains that his intention is that it should be totally burnt and not eaten. Because why in the world would he bring a sacrifice and think you, to, uh, that someone should eat part of it? Like if you think about it logically, if you don't get into the whole book of Leviticus, of all the rules of how Hashem says to bring a sacrifice, if you just think in general terms logically, an know. animal sacrifice to Hashem. So you'd say, okay, so what, what is it, barbecue? I get to eat it? Someone else gets to eat it? No. It's Tashem. That means I'm going to burn the whole animal to Hashem. So either you don't get the whole concept of a sacrifice, say that's a waste of an animal, or you say, no, I get it. The animal is in, in my place, in my stead, or I'm elevating, whatever you want to say, however you understand this spiritual thing. But the point is, you wouldn't guess that I get to eat it, or part of it. So therefore, even though he brought it as a peace offering, according to Rashi's explanation mm -hmm. of what the logic is, is he means it for Hashem's sake, which means his intention really was that it should be a burnt offering, even though he said it's a peace offering. Mm -hmm. Well, if you want the verse, it says, Hashem Anything which they offer has to be a burnt offering. So we do have a, a, a pasuk, a verse, to support that. And that is... How is that talking about non Jews as well? Leviticus 3 1? Um, no. No? I don't think so. 22. Do you see anything in Leviticus 22? Because I want a verse which is speaking about the non Jew. You may be right, but let's see. Yeah, oh, ha, 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 ha. You're going to like this gossip. Okay, you hear what it says? This is Leviticus 22. It's in Parshas Emmer. And this section begins with verse 17. And it reads as follows. And Hashem spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, meaning the priests, Israel, and to all the children of Israel, and say to them, Ish, Ish, Yisrael, any man from the house of Israel, Umin Hager be Israel, and of the Ger in Israel, Asheyakriv Karbonoi, that will offer his sacrifice. The Holy Dreim for any of their vows, the Holy Dvaisim or any of their donations, Akriv Ashe Akriv Hashem Loila, which they're going to bring to Hashem as a burnt offering. So, of course, the question is, Min Hager be Yisrael. So, so it says the, pra, the, the, the proselytes among Israel. 
What did it say? Ger twice? There's no, the no, no, ger, no. Just as it once. Ger of Israel. Oh. Hag, we mean Hager be Israel. Mm. But you would assume that if it's talking about the Ger Tzedek, the one who converted and became Jewish, why do I need to include that him? That would be the Yishish of He's, Israel. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. It's like you don't say that when it comes to the Mitzvah of Tzitzis. You don't say, speak to the children of Israel that um, if you wear a four-quartered garment and you're from Israel or a ger, be Israel. No. Mm-hmm. So maybe this verse is talking about the non-Jew. The non-Jew ger. And we're calling him the ger, which otherwise is the ger toishav, like you were saying. Otherwise, how can he even get to the border? To the, mm-hmm. um, I'm going to pass mm-hmm. one of those. Let's see how they translate that. The, well, the, 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 yeah, that's very good. Thank you. So 22. Were we talking about a peace offering? Well, that's the thing. We're talking about a donation, mm. a nether or an adava, which means oh, either, an oath. And it can o- right. He vowed to bring a, a sacrifice, vow, yeah. and it can only be brought as an oila, as a burnt offering. Mm. If any man from the house of Israel or from the Jewish converts or non-Jews in parentheses, uh, really? Oh, so Rashi Was that said Rashi? that. Yeah. Well, oh, it's maybe. getting kind of well, weird now. What's going on? There's no rashing on this verse. Hmm. If any man from the house of Israel... One second, one second, one yeah. second. No, 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 no. Wait, am I getting it wrong? Second. Hmm. Speak there. No, 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 no. Okay, one second. No, 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 no. Say to them, Ish, ish, mi beis Yisrael. If any man from the house of Israel or from the Jewish converts or non-Jews brings his offering to fulfill one of his vows or one of his pledges, which he promised to offer up to Hashem as a burnt offering. Oh, the Gutnik edition got it right. <laughs> well, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's he, pretty... You know, he usually does. Yeah, I know, I'm joking. No, but I'm uh, wondering... Like art scroll kind why of... Why does he stuff. put or non-Jews in parentheses? Yeah, so it's like something he's going on. Translating he's translating... He's getting that? it from somewhere. Yeah, where but is he ish, getting it? Ish, he says... A man from the house of Israel or from the Jewish converts. So the, well, the parentheses would be on the Jewish converts and referring also. You know, oh, so that, that's what's adding I, to the Garrett. I guess, yeah. That's but out of Gutnik, that might be something from a Rebbe's teaching or something. Yeah, what's going on here? Um, what we need to do is look mm. up what we don't have here, and that is the Tegash Lema on this verse. Mm. Got to look up the Tehra Shlema from Rabbi Kasher on this verse to see what the uh, Chacham yeah. say. Can you pass me? Where is that set? All set is missing. The Tehra Tamima. It's missing. That's strange. Do you see it behind you, maybe, in the next shelf? Behind you, what's hmm? the Chumash? What happened to the whole set? See that whole mm-hmm. section is empty? Mm-hmm. That is indeed strange. Wow. It was just here the other day. The entire set. All right, let us proceed. So, again, the Rambam rules that a non Jew can only bring an oila, a burnt offering, and not any other carbon, not a shlumming, not a um, peace offering. Um, we are in the right hand column. Some 12, 13 lines down. Last word on the line. Vehakoil. Vehakoil ksherim lahakriv livne noyach. And everything, all types of animals, are fit 
to be as an offering for Bnei Noach, as a sacrifice. Hafilu chayois v'tarnagoylois, zecharim v'nekevois, t'mimim uvalei mumim, tohoirim v'loi t'meim. They can be animals, they can be fowl, uh, they can actually be um, chickens, male or female, unblemished or blemished, but they have to be tehoirim from a kosher type and not tmeim. They cannot be from a non-kosher type of an animal. But they don't have all the same restrictions as the Jews, but it has to be a kosher type of an animal. Shenemar, for the verse says, Vayiven noyach mizbeach l'ashem, and noyach built an altar for Hashem, vayikach mikola behema tahira, and he took from all of the pure, all the kosher animals, and he took from all the types of kosher birds. So what does it mean that they're pure? The meaning is, those that no sin was committed with them. You see, because we have a problem, at that point, Hashem did not tell anyone yet what animals are kosher and not kosher. Yeah. So one opinion, which is what they bring down in the footnote, in footnote um, three... I've always wondered that. 374. So, and this is what Rashi brings down in the as well that it's what's going to be kosher after Hashem gives the Torah to the Jewish people. So Noyach was already told, these are the animals that I want you to take seven of. And, the, and therefore they're referred to as Tahar because they're going to be in the future declared as Tahar. But that's not what he's saying over here in the text itself. Here they're going along with the opinion that it means that no sin was committed with them. Such as um, what's it called? Bistanami? Bisti- bestiality. bestiality. So as long as that wasn't done to an animal, so the animal is tahar, is pure. B'nei noyach mutarim lahakriv karbanayseim b'chol makayim. B'nei noyach are permitted to offer their sacrifices anywhere. It does not need to be in the temple in Jerusalem, but anywhere is fine. V'ein isur shchutechutz noyeg bohem. And there's no prohibition of sacrificing, of slaughtering um, uh, an animal which is designated as a sacrifice chutz, outside of the temple, which for a Jew is a big prohibition. And that is provided that they will offer it on a bama, on an altar. Okay, they can't just do it on the ground, but it has to be on a bama, on a high type of an altar, but otherwise Anywhere they want is fine, wherever you live. So Chicago or Pittsburgh, California, Florida, New York, Afghanistan, China, Japan, anywhere. Probably not at the, where the base of Mikdash was. Oh, so okay. you're saying nowadays, now with, when it's... Because the Ramam says in all places everywhere, but I wonder if that's forbidden. Well, it has to be a place that they have, you know, that you can't do it on somebody else's land. But, mm, yeah, and the but temple, the temple ground has, has sanctity to it. It does it. The Ravid seems to say that a lot of the sanctity left. So mm. I'm wondering, I mean, I would say no too, right? I mean, I would say it's probably not a... <laughs> A good place for it, but I find it an interesting question. Maybe it actually is a good place. A Jew can't go there, right? But a Ben Noyach, he's not restricted, yeah, or good. is he? Well, actually, when the temple is standing, then there's restrictions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, right. A non-Jew can't go past a certain point. Yeah. The question is, when the base mitzvah is not standing, yeah. maybe it arouses something. Maybe it's something. I'll let you do that one. <laughs> Sneak in there, Bob. <laughs> All right. 
Nachri, Shasna Mitzvah, a non Jew that fulfilled the commandment other than the seven, one that he's not obligated to do. Like we said, that we don't hold him back from doing it if he's doing it for reward. He receives reward for doing a mitzvah. In other words, what you may think is that there's different categories. There's someone who's commanded, and there's someone who's not commanded, who's doing it voluntarily. So you may think that since this non-Jew is completely voluntarily doing this mitzvah, no one asked him to do it, he's not commanded, so you may think he doesn't get rewarded. And we're saying, no, he does get rewarded. But he's not in the same category. He's not getting rewarded like one who's commanded and does it. But rather like one who's not commanded and they do it. Now you even have this concept within Jews themselves. You have a person who's not obligated to do a certain mitzvah and they choose to do it. That person gets a lesser reward for doing it, but they still get rewarded. So similarly, the non-Jew, the nochri, who's doing a mitzvah by choice for the sake of getting rewarded, he will get rewarded as one who's not commanded and is doing it voluntarily. Avoschar mitzvah biyadoi. But he actually does have the reward of doing a mitzvah. Don't just think, okay, well, let's give him a reward because he's trying for effort. No, no, no. It's not just a mitzvah. Not just getting rewarded for an effort. He's actually getting rewarded for doing a mitzvah. He's not Jewish. He's not commanded to do this. It's one of the other mitzvahs. It's not one of the seven, but he wants to do it. So we don't hold him back from doing it kahalacha, properly. And then when he does it, he actually gets rewarded for doing it as um, a mitzvah, as a voluntary mitzvah. Hmm. A lesser reward, but it's a reward of a mitzvah. Vatayra hmm. Amra. So what is that then? Did you describe that, Rabbi Turn? The reward... A, a voluntary mitzvah? Well, what we would compare it to is... It's not exactly the same, but for practical purposes, there are many commandments in the Torah that women are exempt from keeping. Mm. Positive commandments that have a set time, as a rule, women don't have to keep. Mm. Yet many of them, they do. And they're very careful to do them. That's voluntary. Oh, I see. Okay. So they get a lesser reward. No, is that similar to commanded and does rather than not commanded and does? Or is this something that, that, different? That, no, no, well? that's what it is. That's what it is. Not commanded and does. Okay. So that's voluntary. And the Torah states, Kachem Kager. Again, the word Ger. And this is in Bamidbar, Numbers 15.15. The libations, talking about the pouring of the wine on the altar. And then the verse says, V'chiyogur itchem ger. When a praslet sojourns with you. When a convert comes to live with you, or likewise for the converts already among you at any time throughout the generations, and he offers up a fire offering of pleasant aroma to Hashem, he should sacrifice it just as you do. One statute applies for the entire assembly, both for yourselves and for the convert who lives with you. One statute applies throughout 
your generations, just as it is for you, so shall it be for the convert. So here it's saying convert. Okay, so this is really the verse which is teaching us about the carbon, the sacrifice that a person who converts to Judaism has to bring. And interesting to note, the Rambam says as follows. This is the laws of conversion from Yisuri Bia, Laws of Forbidden Relations. Chapter 13. The Jewish people entered into the covenant through three things. Circumcision, ritual immersion, and offering a sacrifice. So too at any later point when a non-Jew wishes to enter into the covenant, as the verse states, just as it is for you, so shall it be for the convert. Just as you enter the covenant with circumcision, immersion, and offering a sacrifice, Likewise, he is required to carry out circumcision, to immerse in a mikvah, and to bring a sacrifice. Which, which footnote are we looking at? I'm not looking at the footnote right now. But how did we get to this? Oh, because he said kochem kager was the pasuk, mm-hmm. which said that a non-Jew gets rewarded, and that was footnote 377, which simply referenced a midbar tesvav tesvav. Numbers 1515. 377. What is he doing? You got it? Right. Okay. Yeah. So is he low mitzvah or is he mitzvah? In the current era, when a sacrifice is not possible, only circumcision and immersion are required of the convert. When the temple would be rebuilt, he will bring the sacrifice. Okay, then the Rambam in the other place, in the laws of Mchusre Kapara, individuals requiring atonement, if a convert underwent circumcision and immersion, but did not yet bring a sacrifice, the absence of the sacrifice holds him back from becoming a complete convert. Like other authentic Jews, he is not permitted to eat from sacrifices as he has not yet become like other authentic Jews. Now the Ragachavar on that says as follows, Only with respect to sacrifices we say he is not yet a complete convert, but in other matters he is considered a Jew in every respect. Therefore in the current era he loses nothing by failing to bring a sacrifice. Mechamashech brings that down a lot of times. Because otherwise, when you read the Rambam, it sounds like without the sacrifice, he's not totally oh, Jewish. Oh, yeah. So the Raghav says, no, it's only as far as the sacrifices are concerned that he cannot eat from sacrifices until he brings his sacrifice. Anyway, so the words are kochem kager. Ulefi chachem, therefore, nachri, a non-Jew, sheroitze lihim oileshe mitzvah, who would like to be circumcised for the sake of the mitzvah. Not to become Jewish, but he wants to do this great mitzvah of circumcision. Yisrael mal oisoi, a Jew shall circumcise him. So you don't go to the doctor who's not Jewish. You don't go to your non-Jewish friend. On the contrary, even the father of the child, normally the mitzvah is on the father's, the, the mitzvah for Jews who are obligated. It's, not, it's mitzvah voice who are commanded to do it. It's obligatory, not optional. Where's Rabbi Wolf? So the mitzvah is that the father is supposed to circumcise his son. Mm. However, in most cases, that's not a good idea for practical mm. reasons. So therefore, <laughs> we have a special rule in Torah called shlichus. Shluchei shaladam kemaisai. A Jew can appoint another Jew to be his emissary, his extended hand. And therefore, if I appoint him to do something and he does it on my behalf, I did it. Mm. So when I get that moyel, the circumcising so-called rabbi, he does it on my behalf. I circumcised my son because it was my shliach. Mm. And that's why actually the proper way to do it is that beforehand the moyel actually gives the knife to the father of the baby to pick it up and he says I want you to appo- give this to me and appoint me as your agent to do it mm. and that's what's done alright so what would be in a case of a nachri 
of a Ben Noyach who wants to circumcise his son. Don't do it yourself because you're not Jewish. So you should actually get the Jew to do it so that it's done properly. Mm-hmm. Not just properly physically that he knows exactly how to cut and what to do, but properly meaning by a person who is requ- shaykh to this mitzvah. Mm-hmm. Well, then in that case, the, the, the moral shil- would the- not be the, the shliach. What? He would, the the moyo would actually be doing the mitzvah. Okay, well, the, you run then into the question, is there shlichus by non-Jews? In other words, mm-hmm. for a Jew to appoint a shliach mm-hmm. can only be another Jew. A Jew can't make a non-Jew his shliach, except for when it's going to harm him. Like when it comes to Shabbos, I can't hire a non-Jew to do malacha for me on Shabbos. I say, why not? He doesn't have to, he's not allowed to keep Shabbos. Mm-hmm. Because then we say that in the negative, for as far as Shabbos is concerned, mm-hmm. the non-Jew is your shliach. But otherwise, as far as doing a mitzvah for a Jew to appoint a shliach, the shliach has to be a Jew. Right, but if a Ben Nolak wanted to do the, circum- do, do the mitzvah of circumcision, he should not do it himself or have the shliach, have the, have the moyo as a shliach, he should ask the moyo to, to perform it. it. Right. Because the moyo is a Jew. So the moyo is doing it. Yeah. You get it. Ke, chasa, ke, uh, like, like the right. halacha says. Now, the source for this, that a Jew should do the milah in 378, yeah, is Shuvas HaRambam. It's a responsa oh. from the Rambam. Really? Not Mishnah Torah. Then they say, and take a look in, in Rambam, the laws of milah, chapter 3, Psst, law 7. seven. But the, they just, but the source I for it outright. Seen the responsa, yeah. Right. Oh so, my goodness. <laughs> okay. All right. So it's the response of the Rambam, and it's the publication of Freiman, and that would be in that particular version, number one, uh, responsa number one twenty four. Chuvas Rambam Freiman. At home, I have a Chuvas Rambam. I just don't know if it would be Freiman, but I could find it. That would be um, interesting. Let's take out... Can you pass me Rambam Ahava? Right there. Say for Ahava. <laughs> it's probably out of order. It may not be put there in order. <laughs> Thank you. Aha, uh-huh, that's where the tongue is put here. The 3-7. Yeah, and they bring this up as a bit of a contradiction. Oh, and they do bring that response here. <gasps> I was hoping that that would be <gasps> <laughs> what was that? What, what was the actual response uh, uh, letter? Or well, the, here. 3-7. Yep. Okay. One moment here. Let's take one thing at a time. Wait a second. All right, first of all, the Rambam in three three says as follows, which this seems to contradict the, the point. That's why they're telling you to mm-hmm. look it up. Goy that needs to have his foreskin mm. cut off for some medical reason. Mm-hmm. Either he's got uh, some kind of a skin Jew disease there. So, so it's simply for, not for any mitzvah. So a Jew is not allowed to do it. Mm-hmm. So if you have a Jewish doctor, he's not allowed to physically be the one, or the nurse, if he's Jewish, can't uh, be the one. Why? Because it's an act of circumcision, and we don't circumcise them. And also for, because it's saving a, a, a goy's life, which is a problem In there. Right, because we're not allowed to... Even though a mitzvah is happening by healing them, but he didn't do it for the sake of a mitzvah. Mm-hmm. For healing. Right. So wait, so this implies yeah. that for the sake of a mitzvah would be okay. Therefore, if the guy is intending for milah, then it's a mitzvah to circumcise him. Okay, so no, this, this is not a contradiction. Yeah, right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, See, somebody else was trying to tell me it was. And, uh, you know. Okay, for the sake of mitzvah of milah, but not for the sake of conversion. All right, now, let's see it in the tshuva, so we have to bring it down. So 
So we got to remember the responses in here. I think Rabbi, um, I think it was Rabbi Feinstein that, that went into this. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And he says that that Goy there is actually going through Garrus. That's, yeah, what, that's, that's what he said. That was his uh-huh. understanding, yeah. But. Well, they say to look up the response in the back. He says he's going through Garrus. He says he's not a Gar yet. That's, that was mm. the thing. Which then one could argue, you know, at what point is uh, non-Jewish gear gearing mm-hmm. and stuff like that. If it, like, for instance, if a gear to shavs katsas gears, if he has a little bit of, if he's a little gear, basically, it's like, so there seems to be some kind of intermediary process or something that might not be ideal, or maybe it, you know, whatever. Okay, this is from this Freiman that we're talking about. Sure. About Vram Chaim Freiman. And it was first, it was published in Yerushalayim around 1934. And I don't, and they say to look up here in the back, but I don't see that particular one. Fryman. Remember now, I got in an argument with that one guy. <laughs> that, that big morning. Well, I don't know. They, it's Chuvas Rambam, and they say to look it up here in the back, but I don't see it. So we have to actually look up in the Chuvas Rambam. Maybe it's under a different halacha. I don't know. I don't think they would tell us that, though. So, but that is the um, source that. Yisrael Malay say a Jew should circumcise a Nachri who wants to be circumcised for the sake of the mitzvah. And does it say uh, like a page or uh, just in that law in Hilchos Mila? His response, I don't. In know the response, how, yeah, I don't know it how the says one. Are. It says Simon, which would be like chapter one twenty four. Thank you. The Chosul Rishonim. And then there are Rishonim that wrote the Chosul Rishonim Shemikev and Shan Nochrim that since the non Jews, Afal Pishenim Chayovim Bemitzvois, although they're not obligated to fulfill commandments, Im also mayhem Shum Dovar, but if they did any of them, Yeshlem Ktsas Schar, they have a little bit of reward. Lachain, therefore, Maaseim Bemitzvois Kayomim. Therefore, their deeds in mitzvahs are considered done. It's not like it's a, um, an act which is totally irrelevant. It's not like it's a meaningless act. But rather, it is 
considered a fulfillment. And the halacha is that a non-Jew who gave truma, who tithed or gave the various type of um, donation of the um, of his produce, it is considered truma. And the source for that in 379 is the Ramam's commentary to the Mishnah in Tractate Trumois, chapter 3, Mishnah 9. So the Rambam's commentary to his Pirsha Mishnah. So we see a lot of things are coming from the Rambam, but not all of it is from the Mishnah Torah. We have the Chuvas, the responsa, and we have his Pirsha Mishnayis, his commentary to the Mishnah. Yesh Meharishoinim Shekosav. Then there are amongst the Rishoinim that wrote, She Mekayim Shar Mitzvois. That if a Ben Noyach fulfills any of the other mitzvahs, Mutar Aflasik Batayra, then he's permitted to be Oisik in Torah, Bahalachis Oisik na mitzvah, Shemakayim, in those particular mitzvahs that he chooses to do. In other words, even though we made a very extreme statement earlier, the halacha says that a Nochria, Ben Noyach, is not permitted to be Oisik in Torah, unless it's the seven mitzvahs. But now that we're saying that he's allowed to fulfill a mitzvah, if he chooses to, and a moini nois, we don't hold him back, we don't hold him from doing it, kihil chasa, well then, he would be permitted to also learn all the halachas of that particular mitzvah. Even though he's being oisik in Torah, but he's not doing it for the sake of Torah study. He's doing it to know how to fulfill the mitzvah. So he's not... So he can learn deeply? He can le- be involved says, in knowing the details. Yeah. This is Osik, so yeah, right. not, not Laman. Because that's the mitzvah that he's allowed to do. So whatever mitzvah he chooses to do, that he's allowed to do. So for example, Mila, which is not one of the seven, and therefore he's not obligated to <laughs> circumcise himself nor his son. So he's not supposed to be Yisik in the mitzvah, in the halachas, in the Torah of Mila. But if he chooses to do a bris Mila, which we just said he's allowed to, well then, according to these Rishonim, he's also allowed to be Yisik in all the laws of the mitzvah of Mila. Who's, who are these Rishonim? The Rambam? For this one, that's 380, which is the Me'iri. It's the Hmm. Okay, now the next piece we've discussed long ago. <clears throat> that is as follows. Mitzvah is atzrichis kedusha v'tahara. Those commandments which require holiness and sanctity. Kitfilin sefetera umezuza, Such as wearing tefillin, writing a Torah scroll, or putting up a mezuzah. There are those that take the approach of being strict, not to allow them to fulfill them. So even though the Rambam made a very general statement and he said a mitzvah from the rest of the mitzvahs, we don't hold them back. Some say that it doesn't apply to these mitzvahs that require Kedusha and Tahara, that those we do hold them back from doing. And that, of course, as it says in 381, is the Radbaz on the Rambam in the Laws of Kings. The Radbaz, and these are the examples the Radbaz gives, that he says those mitzvahs we don't let them do. Which is interesting, because Mila, yes, and to put a mezuzah on their doorpost, no. You would think Mila is the ultimate sanctity, mm-hmm. and yet we said Mila is not a problem, if he's doing it for the sake of a mitzvah, but Tfilin, Sefer Teira, and Mezuzah is the ones that he says no. Yesh mina Rishonim Shekosav. Then there are from the Rishonim that wrote as follows, and this of course is the Rambam in the, back, in the very beginning of his Mishnah Teira, in the laws of the foundations of Torah. She'im yamoid ish, that if any man is to arise, min ha'umais, from the nations of the world, some guy gets up, v'yase ois umoifes, and he will perform a sign or a wonder, v'yoyimar she'ashem shlochoi, and he will make the claim, he will say that Hashem sent him, he's God sent, lo mitzvah, in order to add a mitzvah, 
Oyligroya mitzvah, or to take away a mitzvah. Oylefarish be mitzvah mina mitzvah is perush shaloy shamanu mi moishe, or to interpret an interpretation in a mitzvah, such an interpretation that we did not hear from Moshe. Oisha Omar, or that he said, those commandments that the Jewish people were commanded, they're not forever. They are only temporary. They were just for that time. Any one of these claims that an individual makes, which of course we know that historically <laughs> there were people who did this, specifically certain individuals really fit this description. So the Rambam says, Hareze Novi Sheker. That individual is categorically, by Jewish law, a false prophet, and his death penalty is strangulation. Um, I think we're going to leave it at this point. So we are up to the left-hand column on Shin Nun Tes, 359. And the heading for this next part is mitzvahs shenishnu v'shalei nishnu b'sinai. Mitzvahs that were taught and those that were not at Mount Sinai. Um, in one of the previous classes we had a whole section about that, if you recall. But at any rate, again, they're going to bring down um, all the different sources for that. Uh, to be continued in Mirza Hashem.